Uh, I wouldn't say I was the 10 year old that built the PowerPoints, but I think that passion for communications, for being helpful, for figuring out why people buy was something that was in my DNA that kind of drove through finding that niche later in my career or life. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley in partnership with Loomi Tech and sponsored by Hippo Insurance, Turing, Upwest Labs, and Hillel at Stanford. Chief Marketing Officer, what is that about? Meet Tara Robertson, the Chief Marketing Officer of Teamwork. Tara joined Teamwork in February of 2021 as Chief Marketing Officer and has over 20 years of global experience leading award-winning marketing and sales teams. With a passion for growth and results-driven marketing, Tara is experienced in managing full-funnel marketing strategies that drive both customer acquisition and retention. Before Teamwork, Tara was the head of customer marketing at Sprout Social and helped bring the company public in 2019. Tara Robertson, welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. It is wonderful having you here. I know how uh, busy you are with transitioning to this this new incredible opportunity as Chief Marketing Officer of Teamwork. Uh, you've uh, taken on leadership marketing roles in some of the most fascinating companies like Sprout Social, Hajar. I've used these platforms myself, and, uh, and, and so you did a good job as uh, marketing, I guess. But for now, what I'd love to focus on is, is you know, your own leadership journey. Uh, what does it mean to be a marketing leader? Uh, what is a marketing leader? You know, I'm a, I'm a technology guy. I'm an engineer. I'm not, I'm not really, I don't know marketing very much. So I'm excited to hear what, what it really comes down to and what is it like leading marketers and, and thinking about growth in that capacity uh, and some of the insights you've learned from this industry uh, altogether. So Tara, get me started. Do you always know from when you're little that, that your passion is marketing and growth? Is that, is that an obvious thing to you? Yeah, great question. No, I was not that person. And I'm jealous of those people sometimes when they talk about their story and they were kids who built PowerPoint presentations to sell their parents on a dog that they wanted. I never actually did any of that. I think for me, uh, what was always a passion is being helpful, finding ways to work with people that uh, can help them grow in their career, finding ways to to figure out what makes people want to buy, the psychology behind all of that. Like that's what was most fascinating to me. And I think when I was in college and still kind of in that journey of trying to figure out what do I want to be when I grow up, uh, the first time I took a marketing class was actually when that light bulb went off and realized, oh, this is really fascinating. My undergrad degree was actually in communications when I was starting to think through how to find everything that we're thinking, feeling, doing, and all of those things that didn't necessarily have a job to it just yet. And marketing, digital marketing, you know, and this will age me, was still relatively new in a lot of the the industry as a whole. And I was, I loved it so much that that brought me to immediately go and get my master's in marketing specifically in, in integrated marketing communications and launched me into my career. So uh, I wouldn't say I was the 10 year old that built the PowerPoints, but I think that passion for communications, for being helpful, for figuring out why people buy was something that was in my DNA that kind of drove through finding that niche later in my career or life. And and you're not only you know in marketing in leadership positions for for you know marketing for for traditional high tech companies you're marketing you're leading marketing in companies that are helping other marketing leaders operate right totally. I mean, that's a, that's a, yeah. it's a pretty cool uh, idea that you're you're helping you know market the tools that are gonna help other marketers so tell me about this mindset of the marketer what what who who is a marketer and and what types of things are do you realize are important for them as you go about navigating this this really cool persona yeah it's really all about understanding who is the person that's buying so when i look at my own leadership style and the style of how i like to build marketing campaigns and teams and initiatives and really it's about taking me out of the equation and thinking about who's on the other side and what is their experience that they're going through. I'm a big believer, and I will say this often, marketing should be about creating value, not about creating demand. And so, yes, demand is important. If you don't have demand, you are not doing a good job, so you absolutely need to create it. But if you are not creating value first, then your demand isn't going to be as successful. And so... I think that's kind of at the epicenter of the way that I think about, you know, who's buying and to remember that it's 
Yes, there's a B2B and a B2C world, but it's it's really neither of those. It's a human to human approach. And there's always someone buying on the other end. So it's about understanding what is the pain that they're having and then build valuable solutions or valuable content or valuable experiences for them that's going to help them, you know, grow and and get that better version of what they're looking for with your product, your service, your solution, et cetera. Right. And so when you're in a leadership position, I understand that this is all critically important, you know, regardless of, of what, of what, you know, you employed, this is the foundation of it. And then as a leader, I'm, I'm guessing that you have a lot of different tools at your disposal. You have a lot of different types of products that you could be marketing at different times with different verticals. How do you, how do you determine then the priority? How do you determine what is the strategy that this company needs to employ to get from, to, to get from point A to point B and, and explain to these personas that we can actually provide a lot of value for them? How do you go about even thinking strategically to navigate that? Ooh, that's a great question. This could be a very big answer. So I'm going to try to pull that in a little bit in terms of how you would do that. Um, first and foremost, it starts with the data. And the data should always align to um, what I would say is quantitative and qualitative, right? You've got your quantitative insights in what are people doing? How are they interacting? Whether your channel is your website, um, whether it's something else, what are the things that are driving the most impact when it comes to what people are doing? And then there's the qualitative, which is the part that often people will not spend enough time in, which is just talking to your customers, talking to your prospects, understanding, surveying, and, and knowing the why. So you've got your what, you also need to know your why. And then when those things are partnered together, you can actually start to draw patterns and draw conclusions into where you're seeing the biggest drop-off points. So you can lean in and focus on those things specifically. I think in marketing, um, one, everybody thinks that they're a great marketer. So that that's certainly an area where you need to make sure that you're bringing education along for the ride. But two, it is very easy to just throw a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and hope that it sticks because of the amount of tactics out there. And so if you don't have good insights and great data and a great pattern for spending time with your customers or your users, um, you probably aren't going to be prioritizing the most important things. So start there and then ruthlessly build out your roadmap and then even more ruthlessly say no to the spaghetti. That way you can make sure that you stay on track with what your biggest patterns are and your biggest opportunities. Right. Well, were there any times in your career that you're sitting there and you're saying like, I have no idea, you know, how to even approach this. I'm, I'm not even sure, you know, who is this persona, you know, what they like. Is it, does, does that exist in, in the marketing, you know, flow where sometimes you're sitting there and saying like, wow, I'm not really even sure how to begin thinking about this persona or, or marketing this product? Absolutely. And I would say that that happens all the time, right? Like that's, that's the big challenge that you have when it's coming down to thinking about how do you prioritize and make sure that you're doing the right things. Um, or if there's too many things coming in, and you don't really know which one comes first, having to take a step back and, you know, find whatever energy or space is the right space for you to just brainstorm and have that time where you think. I've often told my teams, and this is probably as a result of me being in that just manic state in my previous, like earlier stages in my career of just trying to go and just trying to keep up is you need to have a certain amount of time that you're just sitting and, and like honestly staring at a wall and thinking and allowing yourself the space to think, am I poking holes in the right things? Am I putting this together the right way? And the things that I don't know, who can I connect with or what books can I read that can help me understand some of these components that I'm still trying to figure out? Because that would, I would say, obviously, you know, as you grow in your career, you become a lot more confident in being able to know what that roadmap is. When you're early on in your career or an entrepreneur, for example, there are so many things that you have to think through. And so I think when you get that time to think, you can start to map those things out and then figure out, you know, how do you fill in the gaps? Because you don't know what you don't know. And it's a very dangerous place to, to try to answer those questions on your own. And I, I'm sure. And then I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, part of the dissonance in, in the whole process is that on one hand, marketing to me sounds like something very, very creative. You're, you're innovating you know, these both messaging, but graphics and, and perceptions, and you're figuring out, okay, 
how if I, if I draw it like this, then this is the how the psychology of the person is gonna you know think about this. At the same time, you're you're saying okay, but we're also data driven, and we want to let let points speak for themselves and guide us as how to um, how to improve. So how do you then work? You know, when you have this, you know, a, when they're going against each other, sometimes the data says one thing, intuition says something else. How does that work then? That is a hard, hard thing to to answer. Uh, I think every day, right? Because uh, on every end, marketing can be either like right, very scientific, very data focused, and on the other end, it can be very creative. The marriage of the two together is not easy, and it's something that I don't think you know anybody's really truly mastered that on their own. It's where you actually can figure out teams and you can figure out balance and strength and the way to make sure that people are challenging each other where you can marry the creativity with the data and insights to get to that true beautiful magical initiative that you want to run because if you over engineer too much on the creative side and too much on the gut side then you end up with a brand campaign that might not actually drive the right results or drive the right impact if you over engineer on the data side and you're too rigid in not being able to test and try and make big bets then you're also in that risk averse stage. So it's really finding the marriage. And the way that I've always essentially executed against that is I will start on the data side, like start in the area where you know you've got numbers that you need to hit and there's just a general, this is what I need to do in order for my team to be successful. And as you prove that out and you can do it relatively quickly, that's when you can start to get a little bit bigger with those big bets or with those gut intuitions or more of that creativity where you've got the flexibility, the budget, and the opportunity to think like, if this were to fail, what would be the impact of that? Because you want to fail, but you want to fail forward and not put all your eggs too much in that gut basket. Right. That, that makes a lot of sense. And one of, one of the things that I've always been very curious about is traditionally, I've met the mo most of the founders that I've met were not from, they weren't wearing the marketing hat or they weren't passionate about marketing themselves. Sometimes, you know, they're engineers, sometimes they're, you know, they're product people. And so then you add to the leadership team, you know, a chief marketing officer that is responsible really for the growth, you know, in, in many capacities, right? And at the end, it, it sort of the, the company then shifts from, OK, we have product, we found product market fit. And now sort of the responsibility is shifting more to the marketing and growth side to to now get this out there and to make sure that people use it. So how does the relationship and balance with the leadership work when on one hand you might have, you know, some leadership that aren't really working with marketing or don't even understand marketing? But then you have the marketing that is really sort of guiding the industry or guiding where the company is headed. How does that work? Yeah, I think there's two things that are important there. The first one, and you hear a lot of marketing leaders talk about this, where they'll say, hey, if your founder, or your CEO doesn't believe in marketing, it's not worth it. Um, and I, to a degree, that could be right. But I think it's also our job to make sure you bring people along for the journey and you properly communicate mm -hmm. your plan, your strategy and your roadmap and, and, and what you're trying to do, because there are often and it's really dependent on the kind of founder that you're working with and the leadership team that you're set up with on are they heavily product focused or heavily engineering focused? Are they sales and marketing focused? And regardless, there's still opinions. And I think part of what is really important is from the beginning, you set those expectations on this is what I plan to do. This is where I want to address this. Is this the right fit for how we'll work together? Because that working style is critically important. Um, and then the second part is just over communicate, especially in those early days. I'm, I'm in my early days right now at Teamwork. And so, you know, I'm sending weekly emails out and updates on here's what I'm working on or 30, 60, 90 day plans and then structuring it between when we're looking at people, process, data, systems, all the things so that you have that opportunity to allow people to poke holes in it and people to ask questions as they're learning. Um, and I'd imagine that if you're if you're joining any of these stages, either as a marketer or looking for your first marketer, before they join the team, you have those conversations on, can we work together? Is this something that we're investing in? Can we build the right trust? Because everything starts with trust. And then from there, it's really looking at making sure that you've got that open line of communication and opportunity to just make sure that you can build on the trust that's been established. Right, and I'm assuming that 
a lot of the, the you know marketing that is out that goes outside of the company. I'm guessing that a lot of the time it reflects also on the culture internally with the company and how internally the company markets the product to themselves. So when you join in now as a chief marketing officer as at teamwork or VP marketing in other areas, and you find maybe that messaging needs to change or the perceptions behind products need to change. How do you even go about, you know, thinking that, okay, I'm coming into this big organization. I have this intuition that maybe there are different things we should think about differently. How do you even go about trying to align, you know, moving the needle within an organization that has, has a culture, has roots, has perception about its, pro- about its products? Yeah, I think that really depends on the stage that you're entering into and the propensity of, you know, what is the story of the brand? Uh, I've been really lucky to work for some incredible brands uh, and incredible founders that have always kind of just been very supportive of the way that we execute and go to market. But at the same time, within each one of them, there was a very unique nuance to what made that brand special. There was a very unique nuance to how we acquired customers, how we got them into the funnel, how we looked at um, attaining revenue. And so one is, you know, I think it's really important that you enter into these experiences and these businesses, you know, with your experience, but also with an open mindset that you have to understand the uniqueness of this business and of this brand. Uh, Because the worst thing to do is to come in and say, oh, I'm going to come in and build brand new positioning or overhaul our website and create a brand new brand because I want to put my stake in the ground. Like that's not your job as a CMO. Your job is to elevate the brand, to build it to a level that really starts to build out that personality and that perception, especially when you're joining something that's more growth stage and less startup. Um, I'm entering into the culture at Teamwork as much as, you know, I'm bringing the culture that I'll I'll hopefully bring to our marketing team. And so I don't want to change that. I want to elevate it. That's part of what I'm excited about working on with that team, but also elevate it to a way where we can showcase um, our brand. And, And you mentioned this, and I love that you mentioned it, our employer brand, because there is the component of brand positioning, awareness, and perception, and all of that for our ideal customers. There's also a huge component of this is who we are and makes us unique. And that's that's part of what people care about right now um, and in a digital world. So I think that the, it's it's not necessarily coming in and, and trying to change anything. It's recognizing that you have a perception, but you also have to build off of their way of doing things and find that, that right connection. Right. So uh, this question may seem obvious, uh, but I'm, 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 I am curious, you know, is I understand that the marketing has completely transformed from let's say even 20 years ago to today. I'm, I'm, you know, the number of verticals uh, and the ways to market have grown, you know, by, by a few factors, if not exponentially, uh, the, the persona, the types of people that you're selling to is different generation gaps are widening and you're, you're depending on your demographic, you're choosing different messaging. Do you expect marketing to continue changing at the same rate? moving forward in 10 years are we going to see a whole different way of marketing than we do than we see today absolutely um that's you know i think especially when you say 10 years there's no way for us to know what's going to happen in the next 10 years you know i mentioned earlier when i was getting my master's degree in integrated marketing there was no digital marketing or inbound marketing that wasn't like 20 years ago so it's crazy when you think about how much has changed um and even if you think about how much has changed this past year with the world just doing what happened to the world uh the way that we buy the way that we consume the way that we interact and the way we enter into uh, funnels is completely changed and evolved and so we're going to take those experiences with us. Businesses are changing uh, and marketing absolutely needs to evolve. And that's part of what I've always been just constantly reading, learning, networking and challenging my teams to do the same. Because if you continue to just think this is the way of doing things, then you're already behind. So I think just staying on top of it and continuing to learn and to see what's happening and and, you know, look at social clubhouse that's that brand new and came out of nowhere and so you can see a ton of adopters tiktok also relatively new within the last couple years so you know there are just all of these emerging channels and opportunities to connect and grab on to the digital ecosystem and landscape that you know it's it's just critical as marketers specifically we're on the front lines we need to you know absolutely stay on top of that 
Amazing. Tara, I have a few uh, fun questions. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Number one, uh, your favorite subject in school. What is it? Uh, K-12. It's a great question. And I had two answers to start. And it's funny that I wrote these down um, because they aligned to our conversation is I just really loved art and science. Like I absolutely loved in art, just getting messy and creating and building things. But then I also really love mixing chemicals together in science and seeing the reaction to them. So I think just hands on, um, those were by far my favorite subjects. Amazing. All right. One of your role models, fictional or real? Oh, so I, this cheesy answer, my husband is my role model. Oh. We, we definitely over the last decade transitioned our home life balance. He's a stay at home dad and stays with our kids. And honestly, no matter how hard I work and no matter what I've got on my plate, his job is just so much harder. And I just, you know, I really appreciate him and look up to what he's been able to bring on in a non-traditional way for our family. Uh, that's beautiful. And the hardest question, uh, three words that you would choose to describe yourself or if I were to ask your husband, how would he describe you? Oh, it'd probably be different. Um, <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, I would say the ways I would want to be described, and hopefully these are the ways I would. One is positive. Uh, I'm a glass half full person, no question. Really like to look at every challenge as an opportunity. Um, lively, so I have a lot of energy. And generally, that's something that I'll bring to most conversations and helpful. I think just, you know, if, if there's something that I leave alone or leave behind me in kind of my life, it's just being able to be helpful. I love it. Tara, thank you so, so much. This is wonderful. Uh, I know how busy you are. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Uh, and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you. This is wonderful. I really, and great questions. That was fun. Take care.